Hello everyone and welcome back. I'm Jack Maloney here with my new friend and co-host Tom Bro. And Tom, what are we doing today? Thanks Jack. Today we're going to be talking about some dudes who are violent. Some real tough big men who are physical and mean. Oh baby, we're talking about some Ty Domi, Ryan Reeves type of mean dudes. <sighs> um, I think you're forgetting that TSM let you go Jack. Today we're going to be talking about the top 5 most influential Vikings of all time. Let's go, the Brett Favre, Randy Moss, and Stephon Diggs guys. No, not the Minnesota Vikings. Holy, get this guy out of here. Today, we're going to talk about Norse culture and actual Vikings, and what we think makes these men influential, and what they did that was special. They're big wow moments, if you will. Like, their MVP winning season types. <sighs> Please leave. What? Get, get out of here. My new co host, yep, Jake. Right. Nice to meet you, Tom. Nice to meet you. All right, coming in at number five on our top five most influential Vikings, we have Olaf Tri 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 Trigaverson. You know, I think that's close enough, close enough, or often referred to as Olaf the First. And that's the one we're gonna go with today, yes. Born in 960, he reigned as the king of Norway from 995 to 1000 CE. He is the great grandson of Harold Fairhair, the first king of Norway. He was a driving factor in the conversion from Norse to Christianity in Scandinavia. He baptized the Ericsson, did you know that? Yeah, it's actually my guy, but we'll see that coming up. Nice. He was responsible for building the first church in Norway in 995. He established a government and a new city of Trondheim in 997. Are you ready for a story? I'm on with the story. Jarl Haakon was the leader of Norway in the 990s. His people began to rebel against him, and a messenger was sent to Ireland to find Olaf I. Olaf I came back to Norway, where uh, he came to the rebelling army, and the rebelling army kind of named him as their king. Um, and he accepted this offer, and he became the king of Norway. Uh, and then a man came out looking for uh, Jarl, who was hiding in a farm, he was hiding in a pigsty in a hole with his personal servant named Kark. Uh, when the army came to the farm, what they did was they looked around and then they said, okay, we'll offer a reward for whoever can kill Jarl Hawken. And what happened was Kark, his personal slave, uh, decapitated him. And when Kark came to present Olaf the first with his head, he instead decapitated the slave and there was no reward given. Yeah, very. Yeah, it was tough. Uh, Olaf the first reigned for five years and he finally met his demise in the naval battle of Spolder on September 20th, 1000. Uh, he was losing the battle and instead of losing to his foe, he decided to take his own life by jumping into the water in full armor. He said he'd rather die than see the enemy win. He's a fierce competitor. Fierce competitor, indeed. I'm back. I'm Jake. Jack, nice, nice to meet you. Coming in at number four for most influential Vikings is Eric Haraldson. Jack, what made Eric so great? Well, you know, for starters, his nickname was pretty great. As you can see, they, they called him Blood Axe. That's pretty sick. They also called him Fratris Interfrector, which doesn't sound as cool until you translate it and it actually means brother killer. Eric was great because he lived without fear. Eric's father was the king of Denmark and gave Eric five warships equipped with capable warriors when he was 12 years old. Wow. Yeah. He then spent the next seven years conducting raids all across Europe. It's a bad man. A bad dude indeed. Then, when he was 19 and returned to Denmark, Thinking his dad is going to be so proud of him for all he's accomplished, he discovers that his dad has 20 sons and divided up Denmark into sections so each of his sons could rule a portion of the land. Eric didn't like that, and once his father died, he made quick work to become king. And how did he do it, you might ask? Well, he earned his nickname Fratris Interfrector and killed at least five of his brothers. Uh, Fratris Interfrector. <laughs> and that's not all. After serving for five years as King of Denmark, the people did not really like Eric much, and they loved his brother, Hakon the Good, a lot more. Well, that's a pretty self-explanatory nickname. You could say. 
So Hakon the Good returned from England, and Eric was quick to give up the throne. He made a deal with the King of England and became King of Northumbria. Ever heard of that, Jake? Of course. It's what they used to call Northern England and Southern Scotland. You're actually right. Blood Axe, though, he was still violent when he was in charge. After the death of the English king he made a deal with, a new king took over, and he didn't really take kindly to sharing part of his land with the Viking leader. So, to anger Eric, he raided part of Northumbria. And that made him mad. Eric assembled men so quickly that they tracked down the English invaders before they could make it back from Northumbria. I'm sure a guy with a nickname like Blood Axe did not treat these people so kindly. Right again. Eric and his gang made quick work of the English and killed each member of the raiding clan. Now, remember when I said he was fearless? He certainly was. He didn't care that the English way outnumbered the people of Northumbria, way outnumbered all of his clan, and that they had way more soldiers. But the people of Northumbria, they were scared of retaliation. So they exiled Eric and made a deal with the English king for him to reclaim that land. Seven years later, the people of Northumbria made a new king, and that didn't go over well for our boy Bloodaxe. He invaded Northumbria with his sons and became king again, until the English king reclaimed Northumbria a year later, and Eric died gloriously in battle. Coming in at number three, we have Leif the Lucky Erickson. Leif was the second son of another legendary Viking, Eric the Red, who we've left off our list. Eric the Red is known for finding and founding the first settlement on Greenland. Eric was exiled from, from Iceland for murder found, and found himself sailing west, bringing him to Greenland. Eric had noticed that the land was not very great for agriculture, but after exploring the new land and returning to Iceland, he was trying to convince potential travelers to come with him and thought that the name Greenland would be enticing. Um, Greenland sounds a lot better than Iceland does, and people followed Eric back and the colony of Greenland was created. Leif was born in Iceland around 970 CE and later moved with his family to Greenland. As Leif became older, he became a great navigator of the seas and a great leader who his men admired greatly. In the year 1000, Leif was sent by King Olaf Tryggvason king previously mentioned in the, our video, from Norway back to Greenland to attempt to convert the people of Greenland to Christianity. Along with the King Olaf, Leif himself was converted to Christianity. This would be a tough task as Leif's father and brothers all lived in Greenland and were worshippers of Thor. Two of his brothers were even named after Thor. Now that must be a confusing household. <laughs> Knowing that this would be a great challenge, Leif decided that he would gift his father with information about a land with many trees and a warmer climate that his friend Bjorn Perjolfsson had laid eyes on once upon a time. In the year 1000, Leif sailed path, past the southwest of Greenland and arrived to Vinland, which is now known as our modern-day modern Newfoundland. Leif and his crew had to stay there for the winter as it was too dangerous to sail back in, until the spring. When Leif returned to Greenland and presented his discoveries of rich wine and good lumber with his fathers and brothers, he was able to convert everyone except for his father to Christianity, even his mother. His father was too loyal to his gods and felt they had given him a good life up until then and he was unable to part ways with Thor. Leif never returned to Vinland, but Leif's brothers tried for several years to colonize Vinland. They tried to do this for about 10 years and after, after the discovery, but stopped and returned to Greenland. For years after, people would go to Vinland and get lumber and take it back, but that, it was never really colonized after that. The reason that we felt that Leif was such an important Viking was because he was able to sail the furthest west than anyone else before him. This made it known that it was possible, which was important in the history of Canada today, as a lot of us wouldn't be here without Europeans coming across the Atlantic Ocean. Jack, I'm gonna tell you, it is criminal that we're putting this man at number two. This guy has had multiple MVP caliber seasons and he is in the conversation for the greatest of all time. Oh boy. At number two, we have Harold Hadrada. He's believed to be born in 1015 and he reigned as the King of Norway for 20 years. 
At the age of 15, he was forced into exile, where he acted as a mercenary until age 30. Jack, what were you doing at age 15? I could barely talk to girls. <laughs> In 1030, he was forced into exile as he was fighting alongside his half-brother, Olaf II. They were attempting to regain the throne that was taken two years prior by Canute the Great, who we will also see later on this list. He became king of Norway in 1046, where he reigned with an iron fist and crushed his local opposition. He established a viable coin economy and foreign trade. Ordered on 300 longboats, Harald Hadrada sailed off with 10,000 troops in 1066. Upon his invasion, he saw victory at the Battle of Fulford, but met his demise during the Battle of Sanford Bridge, where he was shot in the eye with an arrow. Historians widely consider the death of Harold Hadrada to be the end of the Viking Age. Coming in at number one of the most influential Viking that we have felt to be number one on our list is Canute the Great. Canute the Great was born in some time between 995 and 1000 CE, the son of Danish king Sven Haraldsson. There's not much known about Canute's early life, but he is said to have been raiding at the early age of 16 to 18 years old. Um, when his father died in 1015, Canute was to be appointed king by Danish army, but when Canute returned back to Denmark, he saw that his brother Harald II had already stole the throne. Canute wanted to share the throne with his brother, but eventually agreed to let his brother keep the throne as his brother promised to give him reinforcements as, new plan as Canute planned to return to England and avenge his father's death. Canute invaded England, slowly but handily taking over the country. Edmund Ironside, the son of the fallen king Ethelred, tried to stop the invasion by signing a treaty with Canute for them to rule together. In 1016, Ironside had died and Canute was now the sole king of England. Canute was a very smart king and improved the ways of life in England. He instituted territories throughout England that stuck around for centuries after him. He also made laws and strengthened the economy in England. He did this by increasing the value of the coins in England which helped with trading amongst other Scandinavian countries. In 1018, Canute's brother Harold II died and Canute would go on to succeed him as the new king of Denmark. Canute put his brother-in-law, Ulf Jarl, in charge of Denmark as he, did things, as he had things to attend to in England. The Swedish king, Jakob Anund, and Norwegian king, St. Olaf, were annoyed by Canute's absence, and then they decided to uh, take advantage of this and invade Denmark. Ulf tried to avoid the invasion of the Swedish and Norwegian kings by making a deal with them and appointing a new man king. In 1026, after hearing what had happened, Canute returned to Denmark to take his throne back. He defeated the Swedes and the Norwegians in the Battle of Helgia and retook his crown as king. Shortly after this, Canute had Ulf killed for his betrayal of trying to appoint someone else as king. In 1028, Canute took an army of 50 ships from England to conquer Norway, in which he succeeded. This made Canute the king of England, Norway, and Denmark simultaneously. This made Canute the first and only Norse ruler of the North Sea for all of history. Canute is one of the greatest warrior kings that the British have ever seen. We have ranked Canute as the greatest Viking of all time, as we feel he exemplifies exactly what makes a great Viking. He was a warrior, an immensely powerful king that started performing raids with his father and eventually ruled over a large area. He was able to be the only person in history to rule the whole North Sea. New truly is the greatest Viking of all time. The GOAT.